Welcome back. Uh, we're going to start talking um, about the phonetics of assimilation today. Um, so we're sort of uh, not so much switching gears as we are uh, starting to wrap up uh, everything that we've been doing for the last couple months. Um, and yeah, so this is, uh, fittingly, we started out the semester looking at local place assimilation, and then we've come back full circle um, into looking at these assimilation processes, um, and we're going to end up uh, sort of taking a tour through all of modern phonological theory just through the lens of this one class of phonological patterns, uh, local assimilation, that are super, super common in the world's languages um, and really illuminate a lot about what phonological representations and phonological grammar are like. Um, and so today uh, we're going to take a sort of step back for a long view of what we've been doing for the last couple months um, and suggest that... Uh, you know, it's gotten extremely complicated and we've sort of uh, started to, to run into uh, just an outrageous amount of complexity in our theory of phonological representations, um, but in a way that maybe the phonetics are going to help save us from. And then we'll take a look um, at some ideas of phonetic grounding um, in this final part of the class before we deal with stress uh, in, the, in the last week or so of the class. Um, yeah, so what have we been doing uh, for the last few months? We've been looking at a series of proposals about how to properly complicate uh, the theory of representations in order to capture uh, typological generalizations about how phonological processes and phonological systems work, right? And this is, um, for the last couple of weeks, we've been doing this uh, with sort of ideas about the structure of phonological features and how they might be related to one another. That would include both the aperture theory um, and the, the feature geometry, about which features are, are in a dependency with one another. Um, and so, uh, but it also really includes uh, just about all the auto-segmental stuff we've been doing uh, as well. So some of the big ideas that have been coming up um, in here are that some features are linked to other features in various ways, uh, either through hierarchical structure um, or through constraints on sequencing or things like that. Um, some details of timing, even some details of timing that are not contrastive, still need to be represented in the phonology, and that includes things like uh, stop release. Um, and then we haven't spent quite as much time on this uh, this semester, so normally we get yet another week or two weeks of getting into the very, very complicated weeds of phonological representations. We've skipped some of that this semester, um, but one of the things we talk about in there uh, is that some sounds just seem to be disfavored cross-linguistically. Of course, we've seen evidence for that in other areas besides local assimilation. Um, and uh, so, yeah, we're trying to deal with all of these generalizations uh, by complicating our theory of phonological representations, um, and making it more and more and more complicated. Um, and we've now arrived at this endpoint with the feature geometry and uh, aperture theory where everything is outrageously complicated and it's not clear how we can even write simple phonological rules anymore at this point without having uh, you know, 27 features in a tree dependency that are spreading and delinking and doing all this other crazy stuff. Um, and so, uh, Let's take a look at what we've actually come up with here and then see if we can think of some ways uh, to sort of get us out of this infinite regress of making everything more complicated and then finding that it doesn't quite get these facts and doesn't quite get these facts and we need to make it yet more complicated and introduce new constraints. How are we going to get out of this? Well, everything we've been looking at uh, for the last couple of months um, has been based on the assumption that uh, maybe phonological features uh, and phonological patterns are, you know, at some level rooted in phonetics, but it's not very direct. And when we're looking for evidence about phonological representations, right, so what is the feature geometry, how are stops represented, what kinds of spreading and delinking occur, um, what we're looking at is uh, phonological patterns themselves and not the phonetic nature of the sounds involved, right? So if we're trying to figure out uh, whether features can spread, we're not like measuring vocal tracks, we're just looking for uh, feature mobility, right? So do you get high tone spreading in this uh, tone language and in that tone language? Then we better represent uh, those features in the phonology as auto segments. Um, evidence for feature geometric constituents is going to be how features do or don't pattern together in rules, etc. So if you had uh, you know, whatever features, A, B, and C, that happen to pattern together in a rule, then 
that's the basis on which we're going to call those feature geometric constituents. It's not because of the physical properties of those features right, or their phonetic properties. It's because of how they pattern together in rules, etc., etc. And that's what we've been doing for everything that we've looked at in this autosegmental uh, metrical part of the semester um, is looking for evidence from phonological processes for how we want to represent phonological features uh, regardless of their phonetic nature. But here's the thing that keeps happening. Right? Uh, every time that we come up with uh, propositions about how different kinds of phonological entities are represented, they end up reflecting phonetics and physical reality in, in some ways. Right? So every, everything we've been reading um, has mentioned at some point um, that uh, the rules and the constraints and the representations that we're uh, proposing are phonetically sensible ones. They're ones that make sense phonetically, right? So why do place of articulation features pattern together in phonological rules? Because place of articulation is a single uh, physical concept, right? Uh, the, the place where you put your active articulator against the passive articulator is a, a single unified physical uh, idea right? in a way that the features labial, coronal, and dorsal may not be, um, but that's why they pattern together because they all deal with where the constriction is. Um, we've seen this a little bit in the stereotic uh, unit where we looked at post-nasal hardening, um, but there's some strong uh, constraints uh, between how uh, stricture features, like continuancy, um, can be related to one another in time, right? So between closure and release nodes in the uh, aperture theory, there's strong constraints on how those work. Um, place and stricture are also physically related, right? So uh, in physical terms, there's no way to uncouple the place that uh, a constriction is being made with what kind of a constriction it is. Is it a complete closure? Is it a critical closure that produces a fricative? Um, well, those are only well-defined questions at some place of articulation. Um, and we skipped a, a unit in here that shows even tighter relationships between place and stricture than we might have appreciated from just the aperture theory part. But the aperture theory part, even by itself, uh, should, should show pretty clearly um, that place is going to need to be inherently tied to constrictions, uh, and so constriction features um, are, are going to be related to place features uh, in particular ways. Um, so another way of putting all of these things that we've been finding is that we started out trying to capture generalizations about phonological systems, and what we're finding is that those generali generalizations themselves relate in systematic ways to phonetic facts. Right? A little bit more concretely, right? uh, coming back to our assimilation example, which is the one we keep coming back to because it's such an interesting lens into how we think about all of phonology. Right? If phonological generalizations can be explained by phonetic reasoning, why do we need an intermediate network of constraints on abstract phonological representations? Why do we need this huge uh, language-specific grammatical representational component dealing with feature geometry and constraints on well-formed sets of features and aperture theory and constraints on uh, well-formed sequences of aperture positions and how they can be linked to other features. Um, if this is all just reflecting the facts of the physical world and phonetics, do we really want to put this all into the theory of grammar? Uh, and the concern here is that we're sort of slowly creeping towards building all of the characteristics of actual physical gestures into our phonological representations. Right? So autosegmental theory in general um, has been uh, you know, re reflecting this reality that phonetic configurations sometimes persist for longer than one segment. Or I didn't put this here, but equally well could have put sometimes they persist for less than one segment. That's a fact about the physical world, right? It's not a fact about uh, <clears throat> phonological features per se. Similarly, feature geometry is showing us that phonetically related features spread together, right? It's true of place features, it's true of laryngeal features, it's true of uh, the minor place of articulation features that sort of nest under major places of articulation. There just seems to be a generalization that if these features all involve using the same part of your anatomy, then it's possible for them to work together in phonological patterns, which is not entirely surprising. Right? And to the extent that that's just reflecting properties of our vocal tract, 
maybe it would be sort of uh, redundant and not necessary to even put these constraints into the phonological component. Um, Stereate is, uh, in, in the Aperture Theory paper, um, is suggesting that phonological rules and representations basically pay attention to physical articulatory movements. Right? So the phonological representations care about both closures and releases, at least in stops and nasals. Right? Um, and there's a related idea from that same time period, which is uh, sort of uh, rears its head a little bit in the Aperture Theory paper, um, but becomes much clearer in, in uh, other papers from that period, suggesting that place of articulation, even in these local nasal assimilation cases, really only spreads along with other features that define how tight the physical constriction at that place of articulation is. And in particular, you find place and continuancy spreading a lot. Um, this is arguably the roots of postnasal hardening, which we saw in the Stereotic paper. Um, and so there's all of these dependencies between uh, physically related things and how they pattern in time and where the constriction is and how tight it is. So maybe what we ultimately want to be saying here if we don't want these crazy complicated theories of phonological representations, what if we just said that physical gestures are the things that are spreading or persisting instead of bundles of abstract features? Wouldn't that be much simpler? Well, there is such a theory. Um, and it's not a fully fleshed out theory of phonology, but it has some very interesting ideas and it's worth knowing a little bit about. And hopefully we'll um, at least point us in an interesting direction. We're not going to solve every uh, problem of how to represent phonological features this semester, um, but we'll at least get some interesting ideas about ways that forward for phonological theory. Um, and that, that's very much work that's currently going on in phonology as well. Um, so this particular framework is referred to as articulatory phonology. Um, and it bears certain similarities to Stereotis Aperture Theory um, in the following ways, that segments have internal temporal dynamics defined by phonetic gestures, right? So just as in Stereotis Theory, uh, you can distinguish between the closure phase and the release phase um, of a stop, you can do the same thing in articulatory phonology, except really all of the articulatory detail is going to be in the representation in articulatory phonology, or at least a lot of it, right? Uh, and a related idea here, that place of articulation and stricture are sort of inseparable, because you can only have a place of articulation when you're creating a particular kind of constriction. Um, and that is also going to be captured in articulatory phonology, because the primitives of phonological theory here uh, are articulatory gestures. Right? Um, so instead of dealing with features and feature geometric nodes and uh, timing slots and constituency, uh, the constituents here are going to be physical constituents, uh, in particular articulatory gestures, uh, phonetic gestures. Now um, there's some sort of uh, philosophical underpinning here that needs to be understood. When we're talking about the primitives of, of phonological representation uh, being physical movements, we don't quite mean that literally, right? So these are not actual motor commands that your brain is sending to the 76 muscles that control your lips or something like that. Um, these are going to be a little bit more abstract than actual physical movements. Um, they can be thought of as being abstract articulatory goals for a movement. Um, those of you who've taken the Cognitive Foundations class with me um, might be familiar with this from the motor theory of speech perception. This idea that um, the representations we use uh, when we're uh, speaking are not exactly physical movements. They get translated into physical movements, but the representations that are relevant to grammar are basically goals for physical movements. So they're a little bit less concrete. Um, and we refer to those as gestures or sometimes intended gestures. So in articulatory phonology uh, specifically, what we're going to have for each gesture that's a part of a phonological representation is the, spec is the desired active articulator. That's the one that moves. The passive articulator, which is basically going to be place of articulation. That's where it moves to. Um, and the degree of constriction that it's going to form there. Uh, is this a total closure? Is it a partial closure? Is it a fairly open vocal tract? Um, and uh, also in that passive articulator part or, or in the active articulator part or some combination of the two, um, you can also get these kinds of minor place tongue shape types of features as well. Um, so these are going to be the dimensions where we specify how a consonant constriction is formed. 
written. Um, and these are going to be basically what phonological theory is about in articulatory phonology. So let me give you um, some uh, examples of how this might work in simple ways. Um, and uh, just to, to foreshadow here, this is not a fully and completely worked out theory of all phonology, but I can uh, we can still look at examples of how specific things might work in this framework. Um, so we have these simple uh, bits, the simplest bits of phonology, which are the gestures, and then the realization of more complex pieces of phonology, which might be entire segments, which are going to have different kinds of gestures involved in them, or sequences of segments, or syllables, or morphemes, uh, these are going to be a function of the realization of the gestures in physical space and time, and then rules for combining gestures together with one another. Right? And this is going to be getting at the same kinds of patterns that we've been trying to look at with uh, time slots and the skeleton and aperture theory. So what are the what are the principles of how we sequence phonetic events one after the other? Um, and yeah, so in particular, a, a representation in the lexicon um, in articulatory phonology might look like uh, something in 11a here. Um, and now instead of our binary distinctive features, which are meant to be sort of abstract, uh, you know, mental representations that are basically binary plus or minus, um, Instead of those kinds of features, we're going to have uh, gestures that are specified with particular parameters about how the gestures ought to be produced. Um, and each of those gestures is going to be on a separate tier, as they call it here. These are very much like the tiers of uh, autosegmental phonology, except instead of being abstract uh, feature tiers, these are actual uh, <clears throat> active articulator tiers, right? Um, so we're looking at the velum here. Uh, do we want it up to cut off the nasal cavity from the uh, oral cavity, or do we want it down, coupling the oral and nasal cavity together? Right. This is the tier that governs the tongue tip. What are we doing with it? Uh, the tongue body, what are we doing with that? Uh, the lips, what are we doing with that? Uh, the glottis, what are we doing with that? And there's presumably more tiers here corresponding to the other articulators, but these are the only ones that you need for this particular example. Um, and so the idea here is how might you store uh, a word like pen in your lexicon? Um, well, it's going to be in terms of these uh, different articulators and specifications for gestures that we need that involve them. Right? So the initial p here is going to involve taking your lips, uh, and we want a full closure, which is written CLO here. So completely close your lips and stop airflow. Um, and where are we going to do this? Uh, at the labial place of the bilabial place of articulation. So we're going to put the two lips together to do this. Um, it's not going to be some other labial place of articulation. Um, at the same time, we're doing that in English at least. Uh, because that initial p is going to end up aspirated, there should be another gesture in here uh, that we're doing with our glottis, where we're spreading our glottis wide. That's what aspiration is. Um, and then what these lines are meant to represent um, is that these two gestures bear a particular timing relationship to one another. That's what a p is. It's a labial closure um, that, when it's released afterwards, is going to be followed by a wide glottis. Um, what's the tongue body going to be doing during this? Well, it has no particular thing it needs to be doing during the pus sequence uh, segment, but during the vowel e, uh, well, that vowel e is a mid-front unrounded vowel, um, and specifically the tongue body is going to be somewhere in the region of, of the hard palate, um, but the closure here is not going to be a full CLO closure. It's going to be a very, very wide constriction. Right? So vowels have the most open vocal tracks, but you're still going to be putting your tongue body somewhere in the vicinity of your hard palate to make that a vowel. And this line, again, an association line, indicates that there's a specific time relationship between the p gesture on the one hand and the e gesture on the other. And then finally, uh, for this uh, final n uh, segment in here, this is going to be represented as having uh, a complete closure at the alveolar ridge with your tongue tip, right? So take this active articulator, tongue tip, form a complete closure, do it at the alveolar ridge. Right? That's what the parameters are here for this gesture. Um, and there's going to be a separate gesture that says, hey, swing your velum open, couple the oral and nasal cavities, and make this a nasal sound. 
Um, and again, there's going to be specific timing relationships between these gestures. Um, and so this could be basically the lexical representation, the underlying representation uh, for the, the morpheme pen uh, in articulatory phonology. It's going to be composed of gestures and ways of associating them in time rather than being composed of features or autosegmental collections of features or feature geometric constituents full of features. This is what the features are in articulatory phonology. They're more phonetic, more physical features um, that are trying to capture the same kinds of generalizations we've been doing within autosegmental phonology. But here we're appealing to the reality of the physical world. Why are things organized in this particular way? Because this is how our vocal tract is organized. We have articulators, we have places we can put them, and we have uh, a different range of kinds of constrictions, wide, narrow, closure, uh, that we can make with all those articulators, right? So here, uh, we don't need any elaborate theory um, or at least not as elaborate a theory of what representations are like in phonology, they're like the physical facts that they're meant to explain. They're like the vocal tract, basically. Um, how might this be realized? Well, at the phonetic level, um, when uh, the idea is that each of these gestures is going to be kind of a target, and the target will persist over time because movement takes time, and so what's going to happen is that each of these gestures will be active for a certain amount of time in the actual act of speaking um, within these gray bars here. Um, and then there's a little bit more detail that I've omitted here. So within each of these sort of gray bars, what's going to happen is the feature is going to sort of ramp up and then eventually get to its target and stay there for a while and then ramp off again. Right? And so that's going to be true for a closure. You're going to approximate your two lips until they're completely together, and then you're going to let them go, right? and there's going to be a release. Um, and this is true for all these gestures, but you can think of them as just being active for a certain extent of time. This is how we're going to build time into the phonology. So in this particular case, we'll have, it looks like first we'll get a labial closure. That makes sense. And then a little bit after that, you know, timed a little bit afterwards, we'll have this glottal spreading gesture so that when the labial gesture is released, it's released into a spread glottis. Uh, this is going to give us aspiration. Now the spread glottis is going on, but actually the vowel gesture with your tongue body has already started. And this is true. This is based on real x-ray tracings of people talking. When you produce a word like pen, you're already making that vowel when you're producing the puh sound. You're already getting your tongue body into position. One of the things that the spread glottis will do is prevent you from hearing the first part of that vowel because a spread glottis means no voicing. Um, so this aspiration, interestingly, if you look at recordings, it's going to be uh, noisy, but it's going to be flavored with the vowel e. Eh. This is actually true in real speech. Um, in this particular, in English, when you get a final nasal, for whatever reason, uh, this uh, nasality gesture, right, opening the velopharyngeal port, uh, letting your velum down and coupling the oral and nasal cavity, this comes really early in the preceding vowel. That's why we've sometimes said that uh, vowels preceding word final nasals in English are nasalized. Um, what they really are is partially nasalized, and this representation gets at that. It says, well, this uh, gesture for the n that makes it nasal um, is coming a little bit early, and it's overlapping with the vowel in this word. And then finally, the nasal closure for n um, is the last thing that happens here. So this is like a phonetic implementation of what that underlying representation might look like when you actually speak. Right. Um, so what is this going to do for us? Well, it's a kind of neat theory. It doesn't really come uh, with a theory of primitive operations the way that autosegmental theory does. Um, and that's because the researchers who sort of invented uh, articulatory phonology have different priorities. They're much more sort of engineering oriented uh, uh, phoneticians and a little bit less uh, interested in um, making minimal bare bones abstract theories of phonology, but for sure gestural spreading and gestural reduction are definitely primitive operations in this framework. Um, and already just with these, we're going to be able to explain some generalizations about nasal place assimilation. How might this work? Well, uh, <clears throat> here's a sort of standard case. We've seen many of these now. Um, with, uh, you know, let's say this is a prefix that ends in a nasal, 
and this is the root that it's attaching to that begins in a bilabial stop. Um, and what we expect to see here in just about all the cases we've looked at um, is that the nasal will assimilate in place uh, to the stop. All right, so how would we do that? Um, basically, what uh, articulatory phonology says here is that uh, the, the uh, closure here at the upper lip, sorry, I should give you uh, what these uh, tiers are standing for. Um, this I've just called the vowel tier. Um, it should actually, uh, oh, I'm sorry, that's wrong. That's the velum tier. This is nasality. This is the tongue tip tier. What are you doing with the front of your tongue? This is the lower lip tier. So sometimes they use both lips. Sometimes they use just the lower lip. I've put lower lip in here. Uh, this is the tongue body or tongue dorsum tier. What is your tongue body doing? Um, so what's going to happen here? Well, I've represented the vowels ah as being the tongue body um, making a uh, wide constriction, an approximate constriction um, it, excuse me, in the pharynx. That's what a back low vowel is like. It has a, a small narrowing in the pharynx. So there's going to be two of these. Um, the nasal is going to be again represented with a wide uh, velum or a lowered velum here. So the nasal and oral cup, uh, cavities are coupled. Um, this tongue tip closure is associated with the na segment. And then there's also going to be a lower lip to upper lip closure associated with the pus segment. In a case of assimilation, what we can say is that there's going to be some spreading of this one backwards or sliding of this pu gesture backwards. Um, along with probably some reduction uh, of this tongue tip one. And so the shading here uh, would indicate either deletion or reduction of this original place gesture. Um, and then this dashed box is going to indicate spreading of the following gesture. Right? And why is this a frequent phonological phenomenon? Because this gesture exists here and can be extended backwards in time, as opposed to an infinite number of other random features and configurations and constrictions that are not in this representation and therefore don't pop up in phonological sequences like this. So this is sort of mirroring the general properties of autosegmental theory, like assimilation happens when features spread. It's just that here the features are, are uh, gestures, right? They're constrictions. They're not just things like plus or minus, uh, you know, uh, plus or minus continuant or something like that. Right? Um, here's a, an attempt to show um, what happens with these slightly more variable cases. We haven't gone into too much detail about these uh, this semester, but um, oftentimes what we find is that in languages where a nasal assimilates in place to a following stop, they might do that before a following fricative, or they might do something different. So sometimes you get the nasals deleting in this situation. Sometimes they assimilate, but then the fricative hardens to a, uh, an affricate. We saw that repeatedly in the Stereate paper. Um, sometimes it even hardens to a full stop. Um, and so to get at this, we're going to try to represent this more or less the same way, except here the labiodental fricative fa um, will be represented with the lower lip tier. I should have repeated the tier names over here, but I didn't do so. So this is, again, velum for the nasality here, tongue tip for the alveolar closure associated with the na. This is the uh, <clears throat> lower lip tier. Um, and the idea here is that the lower lip will be uh, near the teeth, making a critical closure, one that creates frication noise. Um, but not a complete closure, not a stop closure exactly. Crit is just the term they use for, for fricative constrictions in this theory. Um, and then the tongue body uh, tier is going to be doing the same thing, ah, uh, ah. Uh. So pharyngeal constrictions that are not narrow constrictions. Um, and here we're going to be trying to do more or less the same thing. If we extend this whole gesture backwards and delete this one, um, what we're going to end up with here is an open... Uh, velum, so we're going to have a nasal sound that's a fricative. Um, and one of the generalizations um, that we, we uh, didn't look at too much this semester but is very clear is that you very rarely actually get nasal fricatives in the output in cases like this. And this is clearly related to what Stereate was saying. Um, why don't we get pre-nasalized continuance? Well, nasality and continuancy, nasality and frication just sort of hate each other. Right? Um, now, articulatory phonology in that 12B case is not preventing us from creating nasal fricative outputs uh, because it's going to send the instructions to your articulators 
open your velum or, or uh, lower your velum to couple the oral nasal cavities, uh, and then also make a labiodental fricative constriction. So those two gestures are going to be sent to the phonetics or to your articulators at the same time, this one and this spread one. Um, what's going to happen, though, is that the fricative constriction is unlikely to result in noisy turbulent airflow if your velum is open. You're just not going to have enough airflow to create frication noise because your nasal passage is open. Right? Your, excuse me, your nasal cavity is coupled to your oral one. You're not going to get tons of airflow out of your mouth in that case. So the results of that oral constriction may not even be audible. Um, in, in which case, if that's right, uh, then it's likely to be perceived as a nasal stop. Um, and it's probably going to be transcribed by a linguist that way uh, and maybe learned by infants that way, although we'll get to that later. Um, this has been said to uh, exist in, in Spanish and uh, Capelle, uh, where you do get legitimate uh, <clears throat> excuse me, assimilation of a nasal to a following fricative. Um, and then this postnasal hardening thing, we're going to need something extra to do postnasal hardening. It can't be reduced to gestural dynamics alone. Um, so there's nothing inherently difficult about simultaneously executing these two gestures, as in 12b. There's nothing physically hard about keeping your uh, nasal cavity coupled to your oral one and making a fricative in the mouth at the same time. It's not difficult. There's no articulatory reason why this needs to become uh, a full closure. Sorry, I should have been looking at this one. This is the non-closure one, the critical one. Um, there's no reason why these two commands can't be sent at the same time. There's nothing hard about it, and there's no articulatory reason why this would suddenly need to become a stop uh, once it spreads onto a nasality gesture. That's not an articulatory fact. Um, it's just that if you do this, uh, these two gestures are unlikely to have the desired perceptual result. So maybe you'll be able to hear the nasality, in which case it's going to be super hard to hear the frication. And if you get enough airflow going out of the front of your mouth that you can hear the frication, then it's probably going to be really hard to hear the nasality. Right? Um, and so this seems to trigger repair strategies in various languages. Basically, all the times that we get post-nasal hardening, that's a repair strategy for not having to produce a nasal fricative because nasal fricatives are very, very hard to produce, uh, not in physical terms, but just in ways that allow all of their features to be heard at once. Um, so this is uh, sort of one half of the equation. This is how we might think about um, assimilation and feature geometry and all of the things we've been looking at here in phonetic terms from the articulatory side. And then this last bit about uh, post-nasal hardening and the avoidance of uh, nasal fricatives, this is not going to be just about uh, articulatory facts. This is going to need to involve perception constraints as well. So the next uh, lecture, we'll be talking about different ways in which perception seems to come into play in these assimilation phenomena as well. And that will um, basically wrap up our unit on phonological representations. So we've gotten very, very far into the specifics of how autosegmental phonological representations work. The theory is getting more and more Baroque and sort of crazy. Um, and there's some hope as we look at the kinds of structures that we've been led to. Um, they begin to look a lot like vocal tracks. And so the hope here is that incorporating uh, a lot of phonetic detail into our theory of phonology might kind of rescue us uh, from having to have these ultra complicated abstract structures and phonological features themselves. Maybe this is going to save us some of that trouble. And so uh, this mini lecture was about the articulatory side of that. Um, and these are basically like stereotic aperture representations plus, right? So they have. Um, just like the stereotic theory, there's a lot, there's more phonetic detail in here than you would expect from abstract phonological features, but here the level of detail is yet another degree more advanced. And in particular, one of the important formal properties here um, is that these gestures say that things like being at the alveolar place of articulation and being a full stop closure are just different parameters of the same physical gesture. You can't separate those. Those are going to have to pattern together as physical gestures. Next time, we'll see how perception will also help constrain 
uh, some of our phonological representations in ways that also end up being really crucial uh, to local assimilation.